Hey guys, I'm Georgia and welcome back for another episode of my history series where today we're covering yet another controversial psychological experiment. You know I love a controversial psychological experiment over here. This is the Nobauer experiment conducted by child psychiatrist Peter Nobauer in conjunction with the New York Adoption Agency, the Louise Wise Service, throughout the 70s and 80s and it focused on the study of twins and triplets. How did they study twins and triplets, I hear you ask? Well, they split them up at birth and studied them as they grew. From what we know at this point, it was at its very core a look into nurture versus nature, but we don't actually have loads of information about what the aims of the study actually were. The records are currently held at Yale University in Connecticut, where Nobauer deposited them before his death, and they're sealed until October 25th, 2065. Yes, 2065, 43 years in the future. The only way you can access the records at this point in time is through written authorization from the Jewish Board of Family and Children's Services, who maintain exclusive authority to grant or deny requests after Nobel's death. As you can guess, they're not giving that authorization out to anyone. So most of us will be able to find out the outcome and the reason behind the study in our lifetimes, but like, someone remind me in 43 years to take a look. In 2018, about 10,000 pages of this were released, but they were so heavily redacted that basically no extra information was provided. Dr. Peter Nobauer was born in July 1913 into a small Jewish community in Austria. He would go on to do his medical training at the University of Vienna and then the University of Bern in Switzerland, having escaped there during the Nazi control of Austria, and he completed his psychiatric training in 1941. That very same year, he immigrated to New York, where he got a job at Bellevue Hospital. Over the coming years, he would release a number of papers and books about child development, which was his area of interest including one that was fairly influential at the time, the one parent child and his deep pool development, which basically said that a father's absence has just as bad an impact as a mother's absence, which was quite controversial at the time. He worked closely with Anna Freud, Sigmund Freud's daughter, and he was a co-editor of Yale's annual publication, The Psychoanalytic Study of the Child. He published a book called Nature's Thumbprint, The New Genetics of Personality, in which he did discuss aspects of the twin study, but didn't really go too deep into it. So how did the twin study come about? In the 1950s, a New York, Columbia-based psychiatrist called Dr. Viola Bernard felt the twins fared much better psychologically if they were raised apart. As far as I can find, there wasn't much reasoning behind this thought of hers. There's some child development literature at the time which makes the suggestion, and Bernard just agreed. She had concerns that twins posed financial and social burdens to parents, and that stress would transfer onto the children. She also thought there would be less sibling rivalry if they had full access to parental resources, and that splitting twins up would lead to a stronger adult identity. Besides, you can't miss something you never knew you had. As Dr. Bernard was closely affiliated with the Louise Wise Services Adoption Agency, she knew that those things would make twins or triplets less desirable to potential adoptive parents. So she advised Louise Wise to split up the twins to make them more likely to be adopted. And that just became standard practice for the adoption agency at this time, they would always split up twins. In the late 1950s, Bernard mentions this to Dr. Nobauer, who was kind of like a colleague in her circle, and he at the time was the director of the Jewish Board of Guardians Children's Development Centre and a clinical psychiatry professor at New York University. This was somewhat of a light bulb moment for him, and he realised this presented a great research opportunity, a way to study nature versus nurture, or as a lot of the smarter sources I read referred to it, gene-environment interactions. Working closely with Dr. Bernard, researchers identified sets of identical twins and non-identical twins, and their details were given to Nobauer. The twins were all separated in foster care and placed up for adoption, with the adopted families never being told about what had taken place, and neither were the biological families, who generally believed they were acting in their children's best interest by giving them up. 
all of the biological parents involved appeared to have mental illnesses, at least the mothers, which was one of the main factors in their decisions to put their children up for adoption, believing they'd have better lives with other families. A weird twist is that although a main part of Bernard's argument about splitting twins was about them having stronger individual identities and one child being easier to parent, etc, etc, every single child would go on to be placed with a family that had already adopted a child several years earlier because researchers didn't want them to be only children. It's also important to note that at the time that all of this took place, it was actually illegal to provide information about biological families to adoptive parents, and this stood until the late 70s, early 80s, when open adoptions became more practiced. Once the twins were separated, families couldn't be legally told about a twin, which worked out as a nice loophole for this study to squeeze into. During the children's time in foster homes and long after they were adopted, Nobauer and his team would conduct psychological research, observing family time and playtime, filming interviews, psychological testing, all stuff like that. This started in the late 50s, early 60s, and Nobauer would have teams go on home visits to the separated children all the way through to 1981. Because of the aforementioned law about not sharing biological information, the families couldn't have legally been told about the true nature of the experiment, even if Nobauer did want to share the information. But I can hear you thinking, if the adoptive parents didn't know of the true nature of the study, what did they think Nobauer was doing having research assistants come to their house decades later? Well, they simply told the families this was an adoption, a child development study. Each set of adoptive parents were told that if they wanted the baby, they had to consent to being part of the study. And by this point, parents had already fallen in love with the babies, so they were going to agree. One of the twins, Doug Roche, would later tell ABC News 2020, they would film me and they would make me ride my bike and they would, you know, do this test and that test. And I mean, it was kind of fun for me at the time, I don't know. But you know, you get bored with that pretty quick. I'm like, can I go now? The families would be visited by the researchers for a decade, even longer in some cases, and they would be kept in the dark this entire time. Doug's twin brother was named Howard Burak, and although Howard always knew he was adopted, it wasn't until he was 35 years old, well into adulthood, that he discovered he had an identical twin. In 1998, he wrote to the adoption agency Louise White Services, asking for information about his biological parents. Somebody from the agency called him and said that he had an identical twin brother, but they weren't allowed to reveal his brother's identity. For two years, Howard could do nothing. He just had all of these questions and no answers. Nothing he could do except think about his brother out there somewhere. How do you find a single person in such a big world, especially in a time before widespread social media and DNA technology? But then in 2000, Doug also found out. The Louise Wise agency was shutting down and there was a woman working there who was dying from cancer. In an act of kindness, she called Doug and told him the secret. He had an identical twin brother, saying that she wasn't supposed to say, but she was going to do it anyway. Doug gave the woman permission to share his phone number with Howard and he quickly called him. Doug and Howard spoke on the phone and talked for a while and it was like they'd known each other their whole lives. They soon reunited, meeting at an airport in Columbus, Ohio. And as they compared their lives with each other, they realised they'd lived parallel, with ABC News saying that they were both hockey coaches and had children who also played hockey. They both got married in 1992 and carried their wallets in their front pockets. Their wives had even more similarities, with Doug saying their taste in women must have been the same. Over the next few years, multiple sets of twins would discover the truth behind their adoptions, but not much of it ever really reached the media. The whole news story really reached public awareness around 2017-2018, when two documentaries were released following the stories of the adoptees. In 2017, director Laurie Shinseki released The Twinning Reaction, telling the story of the Nobar experiment. In 2018, director Tim Wardle released Three Identical Strangers. 
Out of the two, you're probably more likely to have heard or maybe even seen the latter. It was quite highly critically acclaimed and I know I'd definitely seen it before researching this. Three Identical Strangers stars with a man called Bobby Shaffron, who describes how he started at a New York college and strange things started happening. Strangers started coming up to him and talking to him like they knew him, patting him on the back, smiling at him around campus. He was weirdly very popular, only strangely, a lot of people were calling him Eddie, not Bobby. It wasn't until we spoke to his new roommate Michael, who asked him if he had a brother, did anyone start putting two and two together. Michael asked Bobby's birthday and if he was adopted and Michael told him you have a twin, his name is Eddie Galland and weirdly enough Eddie had been the former roommate of Michael. Michael called Eddie and soon Bobby and Eddie met. It was undeniable, they were definitely brothers. Just like Doug and Howard they realised how much they had in common, they even had the same birthmarks and the same IQ score. As you can probably imagine, they were just too excited about the situation to think about it too deeply at this point. They didn't think about why they'd been separated. They were just happy to finally have found each other. A local news outlet picked up on this heartwarming story and shared it, but this is where the story would get even crazier. A man called David Kelman saw the article and the adjoining picture and was amazed. These two men looked just like him and even shared his birthday and adoption story. David knew he had to be the third, that they were triplets, not twins, so he picks up the phone and calls them immediately. And once reunited, it was like they'd never been apart. They all moved in together and eventually opened up a restaurant in New York City called The Triplets. Eventually, the triplets tracked down their birth mother and got her story. She had been young when she'd fallen pregnant by a man she barely knew and decided the best thing to do would be to give the babies up for adoption, knowing that she would never be able to provide the life that they deserved. She had lived a life plagued by alcoholism. She had no idea that the boys would be split up by Louise Wise Services. So David feels the need to investigate further. Why did the agency split them up? Knowing they were all part of this same child development study growing up, it didn't take long for them to put the pieces together and realise that they must have been split up as part of a cruel multiple birth study. This was a lot to take in and sadly, in his early 30s in 1995, Eddie would end his own life after suffering with crippling depression for many years. Whether this was a direct result of the trauma of the study or it was genetic due to their biological mother having very similar mental health issues, nobody will ever really know. But, but it is thought that at least three of the 13 siblings who are known to have been separated went on to commit suicide. It's thought that the possible genetic mental health issues combined with the trauma of being ripped from their twins and then finding out about the experiment led to severe mental health problems themselves. We won't know exactly how many unwilling participants there were of this study until the full records are released in 43 years time. It is thought though that there were at least 13, as I said, five sets of twins and one set of triplets. And the Jewish board do say now that everyone who was a participant now knows. However, according to the paper, Experiment on Identical Siblings Separated at Birth, Ethical Implications for Researchers, Universities and Archives Today by Robert Klitzman and Adam Kelmanson states that it's known in at least one case that the board had told individuals that they had not been participants when in fact they had been. It's also thought there were some other sets of twins who were screened to be part of the study but were ultimately not included. The question is, why? Why were certain sets of twins deemed worthy and others not? We won't have the answer for a very long time. Other twins were separated for adoption in accordance with Viola Bernard's mistaken beliefs, but they were never studied. In 2005, the Spence Chapin Adoption Agency absorbed the Louise Wise Agency, meaning that they came into possession of their records. These records, in which the children were screened to take part in this experiment, remained sealed at Spence Chapin or at Yale, we're not sure which. We also don't know how decisions were made about what homes the children should be placed in. Interestingly, in the case of the triplets, one was placed in a richer middle class family, one in sort of like a mid-level earnings family, and one in a working class family in Queens. Was this on purpose? Those records are also being held back. 
The Jewish Board of Family and Children's Services, who hold authority over the records at Yale, haven't disclosed who reviews the documents and makes release decisions. They were forced to release more information in 2018 with all of the publicity of the documentaries, and this was the previously mentioned heavily, heavily redacted documents, but these documents didn't tell anyone anything. All of the sources I read seem to have differing understandings of whether or not the twins themselves have been able to gain access to the data at Yale. According to the Jewish board, all have been offered the opportunity to see their files in the Yale archives under certain specified conditions, but I think this is a very arduous process with lots of roadblocks and bureaucracy to get there, but they say they are allowed access to their own files. The board has said that all participants have been provided with copies of their records that relate directly to Dr. Nobel's study of them. One of the twins has confirmed that she received a limited selection of around 700 pages in 2016, but the redactions made them nearly undecipherable, almost whole pages were just black. She hasn't had access to any of the photos or videos researchers took. As of 2021, some of the twins have sought legal counsel and several attorneys are working on their behalves, but we'll have to wait and see if that leads to anything. I don't need to tell you that there are a whole host of ethical questions that have been raised by this whole situation. As the paper by Klitzman and Kelmanson from 2020 notes, resulting from the Nuremberg trials, the Nuremberg Code was established in 1949. This dictated that subjects' voluntary consent in research is essential and that subjects should be able to terminate their participation at any point if they wish. And then in 1974, the Tuskegee syphilis experiment in the USA, I have a whole video on that if you want to go watch it, prompted Congress to pass the National Research Act, which led to the Belmont Report five years later. This would state that for an ethical study, the principles of autonomy and respect for persons require that study participants provide informed consent. And this would be only one year before the twin study abruptly came to an end in 1980, when apparently some parents learned of the study and complained. It would suggest at that point, ethically, the participants should have all been told. But they weren't. No arguments can even be made about the social good and or benefits to come from this study. At its conclusion, Nobauer declined to publish the results because he knew that public opinion would be against it. Some say the reason the records of this study have been sealed for so long, like nearly 100 years, is because Nobel was committed to the children's confidentiality, but the vast majority of the children have now publicly identified themselves. So why are the records still held under such tight lock and key? What do they contain? It was in 1990 that Nobauer and the Child Development Centre of the Jewish Board arranged to house the locked records at Yale. The Jewish Board set forth terms that gave the organisation the power to approve or deny any request to access the records for the next 75 years, meaning, as I said at the beginning, we won't see anything from this until October 2065. As the University Director of External Communications, Karen Pert, has said, Yale does not know why the Jewish Board made the decision to seal the records. Yale accepted the records because manuscripts and archives determined that the records had long-term substantive value for the research community. It's not up to Yale to release the documents themselves. This would be a huge breach of contract and they'd probably have to deal with a pretty hefty lawsuit. It's not worth it for them and it would prevent future donors from giving their research to the university as well. Since Nobauer died in 2008, the Jewish board could make the decision themselves to release the documents, but they're not going to do that. Some argue that the study was ethically defensible by the standards of its time. Would it be allowed to happen today in 2022? Absolutely not. But you know I am always saying that we can't judge history through a modern lens. You can't apply modern ethical standards to the past, that's not how history works. The world can change a lot in just a few decades. Legally, at the time this study started, it was technically all fine, so it can't be fully condemned. But had no lessons been learned from the Nuremberg trials just a couple of decades previously? People knew that was wrong, Nobel was a victim of the Nazis themselves, having to flee his homeland, but yet he still thought such an experiment was okay.
There are some indications ethical concerns were raised at the time, but obviously they were ignored. I'm pretty certain that looking at this story though through the lens of like, you can't judge it by today's standard, is no help for the families who are ripped apart, for the siblings who've had to deal with the trauma of their discovery. Nothing in this world is fully ethical, it's impossible to be this ethical perfect beacon that so many think is possible, but like some things are worse than others and this is one of the worst. Some argue that Nobauer isn't the one to blame for all this, it was Viola Bernard, it was her idea to split up twins in the first place, based on some flimsy personal opinions she had formed on the back of some child development books. She thought that the way that twins were dressed and treated the same would interfere with their independent psychological development, which I have no doubt is true to an extent, but surely there's a nice in-between somewhere in there. Like there must be something in the middle of treating them as one individual for their entire lives and splitting them up and unknowingly making them part of a decades long social experiment. Surely. Although twin studies have been a thing since records began looking at nature versus nurture, splitting them up from birth was a no bower special and I don't think you can blame Viola Bernard for the study. You can blame her for the idea, but the study, that was all on no bower. I have no doubt that splitting up twins is still something that some adoption agencies around the world do today. I don't think this began and ended with Bernard and Nobauer, but the idea of studying them, that was reprehensible. These kids would eventually grow up to find that adults had deceived them their entire lives. I can imagine that would come with a whole host of trust issues. Not telling people they're part of a research study is clearly wrong. But as one article by a man called Sam Wong on NewScientist.com very interestingly mentions, this still happens today on a huge scale when companies like Google and Facebook use our data to maximise their profit. We're all part of a research study, but it doesn't feel as personal. Wong writes, there is sham consent, but that kind of research is going on today without adequate transparency about what's going on or an appropriate level of control. The year after the study ended, New York started requiring adoption agencies to keep siblings together and now that's a law across the United States, bar if there are exceptional circumstances where the siblings would be harmed by keeping them together, but even then there must be regular recorded visits. I don't think this came into place on the back of the Nobel study, I think it was just a coincidence, but it was good. Some of the now adult reunited twins attempted to contact Nobauer in the years before his death, including Paula Bernstein and Elise Schein, who found out about each other in 2004. At first Nobauer refused to speak with them before granting them an unofficial interview, no taping or videotaping allowed. They hoped for an apology, but they said he gave no apology and didn't even show remorse. Nobauer rarely spoke publicly about this study, knowing the backlash that would come with it, but he insisted that splitting the twins up was a matter of scientific consensus at the time, although he did later admit that the project raised a host of ethical questions. I find this all so interesting, I wish we did have the record so I could delve even deeper into this case, but really everything we know about this is surface level. I want to know why the decisions were made, how they were made, the way they justified these actions to themselves. I know 13 people directly affected by this study is a relatively small number in comparison with other social studies I've covered in the past, but this is one of the cruelest if you ask me. I mean, I don't have a twin, but the thought of even being cut off from just my siblings makes my heart hurt. It must just feel like a part of you is missing. And as I mentioned previously, nearly 25%, one quarter of the twins and triplets involved in this study ended up committing suicide. Does that not just go to show the trauma this caused? Would things have turned out differently if the twins were kept together if they went to families together? I think it probably would have done. Thank you so much for watching, let me know if there are any other studies similar to this one that you'd like me to talk about, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.